Okay, looking forward in uh, <clears throat> this week's schedule, uh, we don't have any diagrams this week. It was just made a possible determination that your second vocabulary evaluation would be more beneficial to get that out of the way today and have more time to work on these papers, which I believe are due on Thursday. I mean, I can look back at uh, um, the, the website where these are posted. I got them written in a document, too. But uh, just keep that in mind. And then with this upcoming evaluation, which would be next week, perhaps Tuesday, I think that would be a, a good time to maybe get that out of the way because I don't think Mondays are very conducive unless it's weather-related. So... Uh, Unless for some reason something crazy happens and we got a late start on Friday, well then Fridays would then be on Monday. So, uh, but moving forward, how many functions did we talk about with bones? Or there are five. Let's see. But we've got seven people in here, so which really doesn't matter, I guess. So what's one function? Okay, it's going to provide structure, and when it does that, it's probably because of support, because of there's something specific attaching to them, and that would be what? What attaches to bones? Because that's another function. They provide sites for something attaching to them. You said support, correct? Structure, yeah. Oh, structure. Which su um, support, structure, same thing. So what might attach to bones? It's how you're able to take a drink. You got that canister, you can lift it up. So it's creating movement, that's another function, but how does it do that? There must be something connecting to these bones. Yeah, tendons, muscles, muscular uh, actions then, okay? So there's three because it's creating movement. So we got structure and support. We got movement, okay? What else would there possibly be? Yeah, so you can certainly provide protection for either your rib cage or, or, or as an example, or your, your cranium, okay? <clears throat> So there's two more. Yeah, uh, stored minerals like potassium, phosphorus, and, and calcium. We learned that last semester. And then the last one is uh, probably, the, they're, I guess they're all important, but protection is probably the, 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 the biggest function. But then the, the second probably most important is for what is it that circulates through your body. Well, of course, blood does. So what does bone tissue do in reference to blood then? It's the marrow inside the bone tissue that makes these for us. Okay, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, all of those. That's right. Okay. So when we're talking about joints, we don't get too specific into uh, that type of a discussion because here are your main ones that we see here. Of course, these are all hinge joints. This one, this one, this one. And w when you look at your thumbs, maybe we could say that's two of them. Kind of same with your fingers because you do have a kind of like a ball and socket on your fingers. That's what allows you to go in a circle. And then, of course, this is a type of lever. Same thing with your thumb. That does a lever and then also moves in a ball and socket. Are we in the wrong area? I think we're good. Oh, okay. And then here, making them blood cell, um, red blood cells, white blood cells, like we said, the fifth function of bones then. Okay. We are? Mm. Oh, okay. 
Well, how about see once where we get caught up then? Or, I'm not doubting what you're saying. I, I'm just wondering. Okay. All right. Movements. You're missing. I bet you're missing all of that. It looks like. You don't have any of that. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, find uh, uh, where the joints is, and then we'll come back to uh, to this at a certain time. Okay. I will. Um, maybe that's something that I do from year to year. Maybe I'll have to. Uh, uh, look to see what's what I have for for notes for that. Okay. Now, when we look at this, it says, uh, okay, makes bone growth possible. You might be asking, well. How is that related to joints? It's, it's, it's what's in between the joints as well that makes this bone growth possible. And what is it that would be between each and every body of your vertebral column? That's an example. What is it that's in between your femur, tibia, and fibular bone? Well, more so your femur and tibia, not so much your fibula. So what's in between there? It's in your ears, it's in your nose. Yeah, cartilage. Okay. Because one of the things we talk about is some bones aren't bones w when, when you're born. Uh, it's mainly got the template, but they have, in certain aspects, these joints have to go through a process of you want to say hardening, for example, okay? Um, and where in the cranium would that be a good example? Think about that as you're uh, possibly writing this down. Where's that? Okay, anterior fontanelle and posterior fontanelle because that's important because when you say fontanelle, how's that different than a suture? How? Right. It hasn't gone through the process of ossification. What, what does that mean to you? Ossification. Okay. I don't know. Was that on your first vocabulary evaluation? Or maybe I haven't gone through that yet. Okay. We've talked about it up here, but that's perhaps one of your evaluations then. Questions on your evaluation moving forward then. Okay. So when we're looking at these types of joints, we see slightly movable, which would mean um, you could almost say like translucent, <clears throat> semi translucent. And what we mean by that is sometimes how light can move through certain substances like for instance um, sometimes when it comes to glass would be an example some of them are translucent some of them are semi translucent which means some light can pass through and some cannot but when we see slightly movable that means your rib cage does move but it's not freely movable okay it has to be able to expand as you go through the process of respiration but yet it still has to be rigid enough to provide protection. So that's an example of a slightly movable joint. Where would be an example of an immovable that does not shift or move at all? If you think about it, we've been evaluated on a diagram with that already. Okay, right. 
So sutures do not move. Of course, that's in the cranium, which means they've gone through the process of ossification and those joints have locked themselves together. And it should remain that way for, for the rest of the person's life then. Okay? And then by process of elimination, what might be left? We've said immovable. We've said slightly movable. What might the last one be? Yeah, freely movable. And it's probably on here. Yep. Okay, so we're just going to go down to here. Okay, and then I've got some bones up on the table that we can um, go through together. Because we've got, we're on number 14. And it says we, we've got to up to 19, but I'm guessing that's 18. That last one, there's nothing on there, I believe. So we are winding down here fairly quickly. Then whether you choose to, uh, if you want to grab a book, that's fine. But otherwise, um, I've got these three, just a, uh, a humorous here. And this one wasn't inside a plastic like these two, and that's why it's discolored. So... Okay. Oh. My mistake, your fault. Okay. So then. And then I don't know how you want to um, congregate with each other there. That's entirely up to yourselves. Okay. So as far as up here, we'll stop there for today. And then, again, if you want to this opportunity to go grab a book. That's entirely up to yourself, but otherwise we will spend a little bit of time. The only part of the upper appendicular skeleton I have is just the humerus. I don't have a radius or an ulna, but we'll just spend a little bit of time on this bone structure here. I guess I don't know which side would be better. I suppose it depends how flexible this is going to be. Okay. Now, looking for a list to go off of. At least I had one up here. I think that's right here. Okay. All right, so notice there's uh, quite a bit of identifications on here. And it looks like the first few are on the scapula. Okay, so from health class, where is your scapula? What's a, that's a scientific name. What's a common name for your scapula? Shoulder blade, okay? So that's the case. That's right here. This is someone's shoulder blade right here. All right, so as we're looking at this, this bony projection here would be what's called your chromium process then. It's just a structure that sticks out. And the reason that that's important is because it makes up what we call um, the glenoid cavity. And that's probably uh, one of them on there as well. Yep, okay. So your chromium process is right here. Now, for some reason, some of these terms and processes can repeat themselves because even though we had this one, this was a condyloid process up here on the mandible, down here we have what's called a coracoid process. And I think 
maybe that's Latin for duck's bill. I, oddly enough, I think that's what that means. When you look at the side of this, it does kind of look like a duck's bill, I guess, but underneath here is the coracoid process. Okay? And then what we see here is your glenoid cavity. That includes this acromion process, this coracoid process, and then where your head of your humerus actually fits up into here. Now, when we see body on here, that's going to be just the main structure. I would believe body is on there somewhere. It may not be listed in that order. Okay, I don't see it on there. Okay, so we'll come back to that. We have this week to work on that. Okay, so where's the head of the humerus then? On your, if you want to call it specimen or model, I guess. Yes, you're pointing it with your index finger. Yep, the head of your humerus is right here. Okay. Now, has anyone ever in here, hold on, I got to make sure I say this right, um, dislocated their shoulder. Okay. So a dislocation is different than a separation, okay? So if this gets dislocated, that just means that it's no longer in this glenoid cavity where it belongs, okay? So the head of this humerus can, for some reason, pop out of this, I want to call it cavity. It's, it's not as stable as it is down here in the pelvic cavity with the head of the uh, humerus, but... I, I don't know what happens. I, I'm guessing it maybe goes anterior out of the cavity. I suppose it can go posterior too, but how it ever pops out of this socket, that I don't know. But the problem with that is when you see or hear the term dislocation, if a similar type of movement happens, is it easier or more difficult for a dislocation to take place if it's happened once. It's going to be easier from there going forward, okay? Because uh, I, I'm, I go with the interpretation that the tendons in here that hold this in this cavity, once they get stretched, a regular rubber band will recoil back to its original length. When it comes to this type of connective tissue, um, let's say it gets stretched two inches, okay? And we'll say it's an inch and a half in length, it gets stretched two inches. It doesn't go back to that inch and a half in length, maybe an inch and five eighths or an inch and three quarters. So it doesn't go back to the original length. It does recoil some, but not as much as it should. And that's why I would be led to believe that dislocations can take place more easily after the first one, after it's taken place once, an individual is more prone to that happening again because of that very nature. Okay, so if you hear separation, what would you think is the difference between a separated shoulder and a dislocated? Dislocated just, mean it came out of, just means it came out of the socket. A separation, what do you suppose these bones are doing up here? actually doing just what that means. It means they've separated from one another. So that would be a separated shoulder. So a dislocation means this just comes out of the socket. A separation means the clavicle here in this acromion process have actually separated. Okay. All right. So we've got the head like you pointed to right here. This is the head of the humerus. You see two protrusions on here, okay? There's one up top here on the head of the humerus, okay? And then there's one that's a little anterior that sticks out like this. These are called tubercles, okay? Now, I'm not saying the problem with trying to keep them separate is you have greater and lesser, which is okay to try to keep separate, but on the femur, you have something similar. You have a greater and lesser. Those are called trochanters, 
but these are called tubercles. And I, I just always tell myself, well, tubercles have a U in it, so that must mean it's up above the trochanters. These are tubercles, down below are trochanters on the femur. So you have a greater and lesser one down there, but here you have a greater and lesser tubercle. Now, there's got to be a reason that these bumps are on here, which there is. So it could be that destroying this is that osteoblast or osteoclast. What is it that destroys bone tissue? Yes, because the blasts build the bone tissue. So osteoclast may have come in here and, and uh, destroyed some of the bone tissue down here, and then maybe osteoblasts have maybe uh, made that bump a little more pro predominant. So it's actually building bone tissue. And the reason for these is tendons are probably attaching these, ligaments and tendons. Okay? The, uh, the ligaments are actually holding this into the joint by bone to bone. And then the uh, tendons then are actually um, holding the, the, the bone with, with a muscle. Okay? So you have a greater and lesser tubercle. Okay. The anatomical neck, okay, that's actually right underneath the tubercles, I believe. And then a little further down, you have the surgical neck. It's just a location on the humerus. Okay. The surgical neck, the anatomical neck. Okay. Now, the deltoid tuberosity. Okay, that is, you could say, right. you notice that this is not circular in structure. It just kind of has a little ridge that sticks out here. That's called your deltoid tuberosity because you have your deltoid muscle that's wide where it attaches up here, and then like a river delta, that's where it gets its name from. It comes down in this sort of a triangle and then attaches on here. So that's called your deltoid tuberosity. It has nothing to do with the bone. It has more so to do with the muscle. So here's your deltoid tuberosity. And then let's see here. Fossa. Okay. What would you guess? And I don't know if you would know this, but can you guess what a fossa might be? And you haven't been taught this. That's why you don't know that. Okay. A fossa is what we call depression in a bone. That's what this is. It's on the posterior side. Okay. The reason it gets its name, this depression, is because on the ulna here, you have an olecranon process. Okay. So then when you look at this then, you have... I lost my place here. Oh, I'm sorry. It's on the front side. I was wondering about that. On the front side, you have this depression here, a coronoid fossa. Because on the ulna, you have a coronoid process, so that fits into the coronoid fossa. So if you had a radius, or excuse me, an ulna, you could see that this projection right here fits down into this depression here, which again is a fossa. That's what that means. It's a depression in there. Okay. Then, let's see here. Well, it's on the anterior side. Okay. It's a, the smaller of the two depressions because the back side is much bigger and then the front side is much smaller, the anterior side. Yes. Okay, and then we'll just do these next two, and then we will stop there for today. Okay. So in your t vocab terms, I know a condyle is just a protrusion on a bone. An epicondyle is a protrusion on another protrusion. Or you could say a condyle is a bump, an epicondyle is a bump on a bump, if that makes any sense.
okay? So when we look at these, okay, we have, when we're looking at these epicondyles then, okay, this is a medial epicondyle because it's a protrusion on a protrusion, okay? So it's actually on the medial side because on the lateral side, you have your lateral epicondyle. And then how do you keep your trochlea and your capitulum separate? Okay, this is called the head of your radius. So what do people maybe put on their head? A baseball what? Okay, so then if this is a head, you put the cap on there. So head of the radius, this is the cap or the capitulum. Okay, so you have four structures there. You have a medial epicondyle. Okay, I'm getting maybe a little ahead of my, because these aren't in distinct order, but I just wanted to go over those four. Medial epicondyle, because it's on the medial side. It's closer to the medial side. This is called your trochlea, and it's a condyle. This is called a condyle too, but it's called the capitulum because it articulates with the head of the radius. Then you have the lateral epicondyle out here. Okay. We're up to about 26 minutes, so I think that's probably good enough for today. So we're going to stop there, and we will catch up to you next time.